We are in a sidebar after just a few brief questions of the gun expert who is the witness on the stand in the Bob Ward trial out of Florida. Again, a second degree murder case out of Florida. The defense version of things is that the defendant's wife was in the midst of a suicide attempt that was likely fueled by alcohol and antidepressants, which she had mixed in her system. Those combinations can cause suicide attempts. That's the defense theory. And the defendant says he saw his wife in the midst of this, tried to get the gun away from her, and in the midst of that struggle, the gun went off, shooting his wife basically right between the eyes. That's the defense version of things. The state says, no, this is second-degree murder, and they're trying to prove it, as we were just d get discussing, rather, with our guest, Andal Brown, as to the defendant's state of mind, his actions immediately after the crime. Now, the responding officer said that he appeared to be in shock, that he was struggling to respond to their commands, that perhaps he had also been drinking, although they don't know for sure because a breathalyzer wasn't even in their equipment that they had at the scene. The detectives didn't have it. Apparently, in this jurisdiction, only the traffic officers have breathalyzers, so they don't know for sure whether or not the defendant was uh, completely intoxicated or not, but they said he appeared to be in some kind of a shock, couldn't answer questions, and ultimately uh, big questions as to exactly what went down inside that house in Florida when this particular incident occurred. Again, is it second-degree murder? Is it an attempted suicide that's been wrongly characterized by the state? The jury will have to decide. It's the second trial for this particular defendant. The first trial ended in a conviction, which was then overturned on various grounds. Some of the grounds for overturning the first conviction were prosecutorial misconduct because the prosecutors had characterized the defendant's silence as evidence of guilt. Well, that's unconstitutional because a defendant has a constitutional right to remain silent. That was a big issue in the appeal. Also in the appeal, complaints about the defense team in the original trial not properly objecting to some of the statements that were elicited by the prosecution. So again, a lot of it goes back to the prosecution, but also the defense not properly objecting. The appeals court took a look at this thing agreed with not all of the defense reasons for an appeal, but some of them, but it was enough to grant a second trial. So here we are back today with yet a second trial against James Robert Ward. It's being known as the Bob Ward Millionaire Murder Trial, the defendant in a wealthy community, very wealthy community in the Orlando, Florida area. That's the basic scenario. Those are the basic facts. It looks like the sidebar is stretching on for a while. Michael Bryan is in the studio with me, former Court TV correspondent, attorney here in New York State. Michael, good to see you. Good to see you, Aaron. I, I like what you've done with the place. Very uh, nice. It wasn't me, oh, but, wasn't uh, but I just sit here. Uh, I had decorators, I guess you could say. So, um, look, this is going to boil down, and I said this before, and I'll say it again, do a couple different characterizations. One is a characteriz characterization of what went on in this 911 call. The defendant said, I shot my wife, and he repeated it over and over. He's speaking very slowly. Is he in shock? Is he drunk? Is he intoxicated? Is he telling the whole story? We don't know. Is that just the way he was characterizing this struggle to get the weapon away from his wife in what now has been characterized as a suicide attempt, or was he telling the real story in the 911 call and now he's trying to cover for it? Yes. Which one is it? Yes, <laughs> it's one or the other. I mean, let's face it, either one is believable if you try to figure out how, how you might process the same series of events. Uh, if you're struggling with the gun, trying to stop your wife, either from, from coming after you for a domestic uh, squabble gone wild, or to, to prevent her suicide, and you, in fact, do pull the trigger in that struggle, I shot my wife. That's a fact. I shot my wife. The context in which that admission took place is, is a whole different animal. If upon reflection, and we understand that from a, a phone call that took place later in the, uh, in the investigation that night, that he spoke to some unknown recipient of the call and said, my wife shot herself. So we don't know yet. We, we just don't yeah, know. We best go back to court. It looks like questioning of the forensics expert is going to resume. The judge and the attorney is taking a break in the Bob Ward case out of the Orlando, Florida area. It's a second-degree murder case. The state characterizing shots fired at this defendant's wife as second-degree murder. The defense saying it was the defendant trying to stop 
a suicide attempt. Then the gun went off, and that is what caused his wife's death. The problem with the defense theory is a 911 call where the defendant said he shot his wife. So it looks like they're probably going to wrap up for the day right about now. We're not exactly sure yet. The attorneys approached the bench, and they continue to talk with the judge. So a lot of things need to be tied up in this case, Michael, but we know we've got the 911 call. We know there's been a lot of discussion today about gunshot residue, stippling, all of that. We know that that was the wife who had a lot of this gunshot residue in her own hand. Okay, we know that from the crime scene techs who recovered some of it yesterday. We're expecting to hear more about that. Uh, but I think that you made a good point. We might hear a lot more in this trial about this drug and alcohol cocktail, if we can call it that, that was in the wife's system. Is it enough to cause violent behavior or a suicide attempt? It's a question. If somebody opens that door and says she's had wine and she's had this tilapram that I'm probably butchering the name of, and, a, and another antidepressant drug, I'd want to know, well, how does that all mix? What does that mean? Does it make her more aggressive? Does it make her more suicidal? What is the impact? Is there a tolerance that she's built up because she's been taking the meds for X period of time? We know that she supposedly was on four times the recommended dose of this citalopram. Is, is that close? Am I close on that? Uh, I haven't close. even tried to pronounce it. I've just been calling it an antidepressant. Okay, so. very good. So, uh, so maybe she's been doing that for some time, therefore has built up a tolerance. The question is, you know, what's that all mean in terms of her mindset and her, her uh, anxiety, if it was there, her violent nature, if it was exacerbated by the meds? We, I, I want to know. I do, too. So we might see more testimony about that presumably out of the defense, but possibly by the state. The state might want to take the wind out of the defense's sails. Well, yeah, that's quite often attacked. If you think it is, is something that might deflate your case, I don't care if you're prosecution or defense, bring it up first and dispose of it as a who cares, no big deal. Yeah, of course. You know, we also had the wife's friends say that she drank but didn't appear drunk. So is it possible she had a high tolerance? If, I mean, you know, if she's drinking daily, you know, one glass of wine a day, two glasses of wine a day, Pretty soon it takes three or four to even appear to have any sort of buzz on. So, yeah, I mean, any, any CNS depressant, central nervous system depressant, builds up a tolerance in your body, whether it's alcohol, Xanax, Halcyon, whatever. And I'm also waiting for trajectory testimony about the path of the bullet. We have uh, dug into the record, and it's presumably a shot through the eyes, which doesn't look like a normal suicide attempt. But, again, if there's a struggle over the gun... You know, at what point did the gun go off? Whose fingers were where? This was a huge issue on the appeal, too, because they had two experts testify um, inappropriately, the appellate court found, about some of these questions. You know, could you commit suicide at the angle in which the gun was apparently held and the distance it apparently was held away from the victim's body? And they, the, the prosecution elicited that kind of expert testimony from not experts. You know, you can't talk about whether a suicide uh, could occur in the way that it apparently did in this case if it was a suicide. A shooting could not occur as it did in this case as a suicide because the angle, the distance. Well, you can't testify to that if you don't have some foundation for that expertise. You could say it. I could say it. We don't know what we're talking about. You know, you have to have the foundation to do that. And they didn't in the first trial, and that was grounds for appeal. Yeah, let's listen back into court. They may just be wrapping up for the day, but they're out of the sidebar.